Uh, welcome, by the way, and uh, our speaker today is Alexander Haber from uh, Washington University, uh, who took his uh, PhD from Technical University of Vienna. He, he mainly studies microscopic physics, describing the matter, uh, matter expected to be found in compact stars, and uh, he will give us a talk titled Transport in Neutron Star Mergers today. Alexander, thanks for uh, giving the talk here, and uh, it's your turn now. Thanks. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thanks for having me. So as you heard, my title is Transport in Neutron Star Mergers, and this work has been done in collaboration with Mark Alford, Stephen Harris, who is a postdoc at the INT at the University of Washington, um, Suan Zhang, Liam Brody, our grad students, and Ingo Tess. And we've published a lot of stuff on this topic. So if you want to see more, there are a couple of papers that you can look up on the archive. So what's the topic of this talk? The question I'm trying to answer today is, how can we use transport and neutron star mergers to study the QCD phase diagram? And in case, I know it's already 5 p.m. If you have to leave soon, this is the answer. We have to build better gravitational wave detectors but also we have to improve the microscopic physics that goes into merger simulations. And that's the part I want to talk about. And in order to do so, we have to especially focus on the weak directions. So if there's any question at some point in the talk, please just let me know. I try to look at the chat, but if I miss it, maybe someone can just tell me. So this is really a three part talk in some sense. I want to start with an introduction talk a little bit about neutron star and neutron star merger and how we can use them to study dense matter in the first place. I will talk about gravitational waves, how we simulate them, how we measure them. But then mostly I want to tell you a little bit about the thermodynamic environment that we expect in a neutron star merger before I give you a few examples of transport properties. And then I will show you a new model for nuclear matter that we use in order to com compute all these transport properties. And then I will talk about chemical equilibrium in neutron star mergers. So let me start with my motivation. What we're trying to do is we want to use this neutron star merger to understand that, the QCD phase diagram. So the QCD phase diagram is really a phase diagram of fundamental matter as this described by quantum chromodynamics or QCD. And in case you're not that familiar with this diagram, maybe on this axis, you have temperature, so you see here this 150 MeV, so that's pretty hot. And here you have chemical potential, or if you want to think about it as density, that works as well. So this here, this line is the famous um, deconfinement transition from hadronic matter to quark gluon plasma. There might be a critical endpoint. We, of course, don't really know that. There might be superfluidity down here, nuclear superfluidity, quark color superconductivity here. This line we know a little bit better. This is what we call the liquid gas phase transition. And we are basically living here, super low densities right in this line. But the question is, how do we know that? Well, we don't really know that. This is a lot of elaborated guesses and a quite bold version of the phase diagram. But how can we study this in principle? So this is what I'm trying to show here. So this is the same diagram, right? Still temperature density. And we have the same lines, the quark hadron, um, phase transition, the deconfinement phase transition, and so on. So how can we study this? Well, it's always going to be a combination of experimental and theoretical tools that we have available. Maybe some of the more famously known ones are perturbative QCD up here, where we can actually do analytic calculations. So this is really at high densities and high temperatures somewhere up here. We can use lattice QCD. This is a really nice tool where we put QCD directly on the computer and solve it, but that's Famously, there's the sign problem that plagues lattice QCD. So I cannot go to really high density. That's more this region here, where which tells me that there is a crossover from the hadronic phase to the deconfined phase here. And we have not seen this critical endpoint. This is, of course, something we would like to see. This region here is more probed experimentally by particle colliders like the LHC. And they also have not seen this critical endpoint, but future colliders like uh, Panda and Nika trying to go to densities and temperatures where they might see this, this transition. Um, for us, more interesting are neutron stars or compact stars. So compact stars for all practical purposes are really cold. They have temperatures in the KV range, which is still a million Kelvin, I think. 
Um, but this scale here is on the MEV. So this is factor of 10 to the cube more, right? So this is really low temperatures for practical purpose. It's basically zero. And that's why neutral star mergers are quite interesting for us. While complex stars probe this part of the phase diagram, high densities, low temperatures, merger, they roughly probe the same densities, but they go up to way higher temperatures. So that's really a new way and a new parameter space that we can probe using neutron star mergers um, compared to just ordinary old isolated cold neutron stars. So neutron star mergers, quite interesting, not just because they probe a different part of the phase diagram, but because we can also observe them in a different kind of way. We not only have to rely on elect electromagnetic radiation, we can also use gravitational waves. So that's really a completely new tool. So it offers a new way to study dense matter, whether you think about nuclear matter, quark matter, or more exotic kinds of matter like hyperons and so on. The problem is inferring, inferring the properties of dense matter from gravitational waves is quite challenging. That's not straightforward and easy to do. But given that this is really a unique opportunity to test matter in one of the most extreme environments we can imagine, I think it's really a worthwhile goal to pursue. So how do we do this? Well, gravitational waves, we have seen gravitational waves, of course. We have observed two neutron um, star mergers so far. The well, most famous one, GW170817 in August 2017, and then GW190425. Um, the problem is the signal is very noisy. So we have these detectors. This is the LIGO uh, detectors in Livingston and Hanford in the US, the two detectors. But you cannot just turn these on, look at the data and find everything and see the signal. That's unfortunately really how it works. Signal is too noisy. What we have to do is we have to use simulations. We need to simulate these events using numerical general relativity, which is quite complicated, of course and build these wavelet templates, these templates, this catalog, and compare the data to these templates. And this is, for instance, you see this here for this is for GW17817. You see this is the signal that comes into a Hanford and the right panel is for Livingston. We can just look at the Hanford signal. You see the signal here of the merger. This is the in spiral, the merger, and then the later phases. And here down here, you see what has been simulated in advance and how it matches really well. And then you see this um, signal that's left over here. So these simulations are really a fundamental building block. So what have we seen so far? So just to say this again, we have observed the in spiral part of a merger, but unfortunately we have not seen the merger itself. Problem is the frequencies go up quite a lot here and LIGO was just not sensitive enough in this part. So we have observed the in spiral. The signal and the in spiral mostly depend on the masses and the two masses and the equation of state. I will talk a little bit more about the equation of state later, but basically the equation of state gives you some idea how matter behaves in a neutron star. And then of course there are various possible outcomes once these two stars merge depending on their mass and the equation of state. You could promptly collapse to a black hole that's a little bit a sad case. We're not gonna learn that much from, from a scenario like this, but we have if we have like a gravitational wave phase here that lasts like 10 to 20 milliseconds, that's where it becomes really interesting. This part is really purely driven the behavior of this part. The signal will be strongly influenced by the physics, the microscopic physics that goes into this, into the merger and keeps this matter from collapsing in this part before it collapses to a black hole. So what we have observed so far is only this part. It gives us some idea of things like the tidal deformability. These two stars are tucking on each other uh, gravitationally, so they will deform each other and they can resist it to some extent. This is described by this tidal deformability. We have some idea of how heavy a neutron star can be at most. We think that's uh, what we call the TUV mass. There is some result for the Hubble constant, um, but some of these quantities have a strong model dependence. So it has been a quite success. I don't want to say this is not great. That really was a really great observation. We've learned a lot, but this is the part where we can, we can learn even, even more in the future. So just to show this again in a different way. Um, so this is the gravitational wave signal 
of the Inspiral. This is the part we have seen so far. You see the two stars here. This one is already a little bit deformed. This is why we can measure the tidal deformability here. And at t equals zero, they touch here, they start to merge. And this is the part we have not seen, but the part that we really want to see in the future. And this is the part I'm gonna talk about the most. And you see here, this is really a 20 millisecond, 30 millisecond time scale that everything is, is happening in, right? So it's not a super long event. So we have to always keep that in mind before the star collapses or everything calms down a little bit, but the exciting part happens in the first 20 millisecond after the two stars touch. So as I said before, neutron star merger really probe a different kind of environment. So these are, this is also a simulation, of course, from, the Hanaus, from Matthias Hanauske uh, in Frankfurt. You see, this is after roughly six milliseconds after the two stars touch. And you see the two different panels. This is really in, in space, X and Y coordinates in kilometer. So you see the extent is like roughly 30 kilometers in each direction. And plotted here, you see densities. On the right-hand side here, you see temperature. And you see there are really, really hot regions, right? So Mercury tests properties of dense matter at high densities. We say roughly up to four times saturation density. So saturation density, in case you don't know, is like roughly the density of a iron nucleus and really high temperatures. Some simulations go up to even 100 MeV. Most simulations reach like 60 to 80 MeV or so. So this is really the parameter space that we think that we are, we are probing. But the whole point I'm trying to make here is if we want to use these mergers to learn about nuclear matter, what we have to do is we need to include all the relevant physics in our simulations. Simulations are really the way to connect observation to theory. But if this physics is not included in the simulation, there's no way to infer the properties of dense matter from, a simula uh, from, a, from an observation. So it's really paramount that these simulations include everything that they can or everything that we think is important. So I'm not a merger simulation person myself, but I wanna just give you a short slides on how these simulations work. So they're truly a combination of numerical general relativity. You have to evolve space-time using Einstein's equations and relativistic hydrodynamics, right? Compared to a black hole, black hole merger where everything is space-time, no matter really. This is a little bit more complicated because you have to describe the matter. So these simulations, I don't wanna sound like they're not good. They're really technically super hard and quite sophisticated already, but still necessarily neglect a lot of physics. The basic point is we cannot give them the standard model Lagrange and say, hey, please put this on the lattice and just start the simulation. Um, this is just not how it works. And as I said, we need to improve, include all relevant physics. So it's really important to improve these simulations to go one step further. But the question is where to start, right? What do we tell merger simulations group? Hey, this is really important. You should include this. This will have an effect. This is what we're trying to compute and estimate. So where do we start? Well, let's go back to the thermodynamic environment of a neutron star merger. I've shown you different plots. This is another version of doing so. So this is now, again, t equals zero means the two stars touch. You see here 20 millisecond is this time scale that I've been talking about. Every colored line here corresponds to a different fluid element in the merger. We're just tracking different fluid elements. And down here, you see density as a function of time. So for different fluid elements, density, normalized by the uh, saturation density again. And what you see here is really, we have strong oscillations. The overall density is going up, but you really have these strong oscillations going up. Um, and the same is true for temperature, right? You see a fluid element that undergoes really rapid temperature changes. So whenever we see stuff like this, a significant spatial and temporal variation in quantities like the temperature, the first thing that comes to your mind is thermal conductivity, right? Is there a way for different fluid elements to exchange heat and get to a uniform temperature again? If you see these rapid changes in fluid velocity, I've not plotted this here, but the first thing that comes to your mind is shear viscosity. And for this density oscillation, you think about bulk viscosity, right? Bulk viscosity is really just tells you, you have an oscillation, a volume change, a volume oscillation. How that is this oscillation damped? And uh, this is described by bulk viscosity. So if we want to look at these density fluctuations a little bit more detail, 
they have a rough frequency of one kilohertz. You see they're really strong the first five milliseconds before they start uh, getting or dying down a little bit. We see they have a strong amplitude. This might be a difficulty, but another, the point I wanted to make before and I'm making again is 20 milliseconds is the time scale we're talking about. So if I say thermal, uh, thermal conductivity, shear viscosity, bulk viscosity might be important. What this means is I have to check, does it play a role on a 20 millisecond time scale? If the temperature, if thermal conductivity takes a year to get everything to uniform temperature, I have a black hole for 99.9% .9 of the time. So it's completely pointless to include thermal conductivity if this is the case. So we need to do these calculations a priori before we tell simulations proof to sit down for two years and try to include that. So just to state this premise again, important dissipation mechanisms are the one with equilibration times below 20 milliseconds. So in 2018, Mark Alford and a couple of collaborators have started doing really crude estimates for this. And they looked at these three quantities, for instance, that I mentioned before. And what they found is that thermal transport has the could be important, but only under certain conditions, namely if neutrinos are trapped. So if we have temperatures above five or 10 MeV, the neutrino mean free path gets shorter than a few kilometers. So we think that neutrinos are trapped. Otherwise they're just free streaming. The matter is transparent for neutrinos. They are created and will just escape. The other condition is we need short distance temperature gradients on a roughly like a hundred meter scale. And we, we just don't know if this is the case, the simulations don't quite, are not quite able to have the right resolution for that. She was causing, they came to a really similar conclusion, but with bulk viscosity, they found it's potentially quite important. So that's why they started computing bulk viscosity. And uh, we did this in a couple of um, uh, publications here. So this is really just a quick result slide. The one point I want to make is, Bulk viscosity always happens if you compress, decompress, and the matter reacts to it. Matter reacts to a pressure change, right? In a neutron star, nu nuclear matter wants, for instance, to increase the proton fraction. You compress it, it wants to have more protons. But this takes time. Everything that's, and it takes time because particle changes are governed by the weak interaction. Weak interactions equilibrate or change particle content. It's the only interaction that can turn a neutron into a proton for instance, right? So everything that's governed by the strong direction and the electromagnetic interactions happens really, really fast. If something is too fast, it will also not have an influence. Everything will be in equilibrium with respect to this interaction, but it will not build up, it will not be a source of dissipation or anything. So a weak interaction really makes difference. So these three papers we looked at are uh, Mark and other people have looked at this. Mark and Stephen Harris have looked at nuclear bulk, nuclear bulk viscosity in the neutrino transparent regime, so temperatures below 5 MeV, and indeed found that bulk viscosity is quite high and it affects the merger on a millisecond time scale. With Armin Citrakin and Aros Rutian, Mark has computed nuclear bulk viscosity in neutrino trapped matter, and they find the rates get really fast in this so bulk viscosity. You can probably um, neglect it, but everything will be in chemical equilibrium for most of the time. I started hyperon bulk viscosity. So if you think there's strangeness, strange quarks in nuclear matter, we call these hyperons, right? Then um, you get a different source of bulk viscosity, but these rates are also really fast. So you also don't, it's quite important these rates to include them, but you don't get a high uh, bulk viscosity. Okay, so this was my rather long introduction, and I want to quickly summarize what you should have, heard, what I tried to tell you up to this point. So I said transport might play an important role in mergers. I said shear viscosity and thermal transport are only important if neutrinos are trapped, and if we have a like typical gradient, typical length scales of roughly 100 meter, and bulk viscosity probably has the biggest influence, but we really need to focus on processes to mediate it via the weak interaction. And we also need a model to describe nuclear matter in these environments for really wide density and temperature range. So are there any questions to this part before I go on and start talk about this model that we've, we are using and we have um, developed? I don't see any questions, I'm just continuing. 
Okay, so we need a new model or a model that's capable of describing matter at really high densities and temperatures. So um, we've tried to come up with a new one. This is published in this paper in collaboration with Liam Brody and um, Ingo Thies and Mark Alford. So the model we use is based on a relativistic mean field. It's a relativistic mean field theory, and this is based on meson exchange Lagrangian. So if you're not familiar with that, the way we model the strong interaction in these cases, you have like a proton coming in, interacting with a neutron via meson exchange, like pion exchange, sigma meson exchange. This is the way, instead of gluons, we use, um, uh, we use just meson exchange here. So relativistic mean field models have a couple of nice properties. They are applicable to a density and temperature range of neutron star mergers. They're fully relativistic, so everything is causal all the time. We don't have to worry about that. And they really provide us a microscopical model. So if you're a little bit more familiar with um, this field, then you might know of polytropic equations of state. So they're often used in merger simulations. If you don't have any transport, they just tell you how pressure and energy density are related but they don't give you any insight into the microscopic physics, but that's really what we need in order to calculate transport. The downside, of course, is it's a mean field approximation, which is not really a controlled approximation. And it's an effective theory, like nearly everything that we use to describe nuclear matter. So there are unconstrained coupling constants and how we deal with them normally, they are fit to saturation properties. You take of nuclear, of nearly symmetric nuclear matters. So you take matter as you find it on Earth, you do experiments, you measure it, and then you fit your model to reproduce that. And the problem with that is, I mean, matter on Earth is roughly symmetric, same amount of neutrons as protons, right? Ice has been symmetric. Neutron stars, as the name kind of suggests, are not really isospin symmetric, they're 90% neutrons. So that's not a great thing to do but we don't really have access to pure neutron data. So is there a better way of doing that and getting access to pure neutron data? Well, carbon perturbation theory can offer that for us. So carbon perturbation theory is really an effective field theory as well for nucleons, which is completely guided by the symmetries of QCD. It's a controlled approximation. It can compute pure neutron matter. So this is what I'm showing here as a function of density, again, divided by saturation density, from half saturation to two times saturation. So this is unfortunately the parameter range that we can roughly use carbon perturbation theory. It just gets unreliable above two times saturation. But since it's a controlled approximation, it can give me an error band, right? So this is what I'm trying to plot here. So this is kind of the region that we think that every model of nuclear matter should be in this region. Is an upper bound and lower bound. And this is the way to describe pure neutron matter using carbon perturbation theory. But this is also at t equals zero, right? Vanishing temperatures. So the idea we have is what if we use this plot, this data, to fit our RMF directly to this and make sure that it's within this error band while we're keeping the properties of symmetric nuclear matter. We don't want to mess up, of course, with, uh, with nucleons and things like that. So this is what we're doing here. This is just described, um, this describes our fitting procedure. So what we do is we do a simultaneous fit to this band. So this is really the same plot that just extended it to negative values because symmetric nuclear matter, as you might know, is self-bound. So it has a saturation density. That's the density I've been talking about. This is where this minimum is. At, um, that's like 0 0.16 inverse uh, femtometer cubed. Um, and the depth here is minus 16 MeV. These are the standard values. So we try to reproduce that and we try to get a model that's within this band here at the same time and we do a simultaneous fit. So we just draw a line here, a representative line. And then we fit, we do the fit, we analyze the model and discard everything that's not, um, doesn't fit well with um, astrophysical constraints, right? For instance, we have observed a neutron star that has uh, more massive than two solar masses. Um, so if we have a model that predicts, hey, a star can never get that heavy, every star will collapse after it, once it reaches 1.6 times the mass of our sun, then we know this model is wrong and we, we can safely discard it. So this is what we have done here. We came up with four different representative curves. This is the same plot again now with our four curves and we call these models QMC RMF, quantum Monte Carlo. This is the way um, current perturbation theory um, was uh, solved to 
give us this error band. So this is the same band from the plot before. And this is the same red line down here for symmetric nuclear matter. And you see all our four models, all of them behave a little bit differently. Some of them are stiffer, some of them are softer. That's hard for you to see. But if you know that the pressure that I get out of this model is just the slope of this curve here. So you see this slope, for this curve, for instance, has a low pressure here, higher pressure here. So they all behave a little bit differently, but they are all within this arrow band. And they all at the same time fit down here, the symmetric nuclear matter. So I don't know um, if you're familiar with nuclear physics or familiar with these models. People often like to see these tables. Um, so these are the quantities we're fitting to. This is the saturation density that I've been talking about, 0 0.16 in, inverse uh, Fermi cubed. And this is really a fitting parameter. We try to reproduce that. And you see for all our four models, we're doing a pretty, pretty good job. Then I said, this is the depth of the uh, at saturation density. So this is how deep we are down here exactly at one. And it should be roughly minus 16 MeV. You see, we also reproduced it. This, this quantity is what we call the nuclear incompressibility. So it's a, a measure of how squishy nuclear matter is, how, how hard it resists to being compressed. So this is also a, a value we're trying to fit to. We have some more variation here, which makes it a little bit more interesting. So these are really quantities we're fitting to. And these are quantities that are a result of our model. I don't want to quite call it a prediction. So this is what we call the symmetry energy. So the symmetry energy is just the difference between the curve here and here. How far is the curve of pure neutral matter and symmetric nuclear matter apart? So you see this is roughly, if we look at the lower bound at 10 and minus 16. So we expect something like between 30 and 40. And you see, so this is the experimental value with the, um, this is the one sigma arrow band and we're well within this. So all of our models have a symmetry energy of roughly 30, 32 or 33 or so. More interesting is how quickly does this quantity change once I go away from saturation? We call this the slope of the symmetry energy or L. And um, if you heard a little bit about the controversy, uh, PRX2, this is this experiment that yeah, measures the neutron skin of, of lead and tries to infer the slope of the symmetry energy in this experiment. And they come up with a value around 100 or so. But every other experiment and every astrophysical constraint roughly gives us 50. So this is the one sigma error band is 58 plus minus 28 or so. So it's a rather unconstrained parameter, which is another motivation to not really fit to symmetric nuclear matter and use these models to extrapolate to pure neutron matter. Because I mean, the exp extrapolation to pure neutron matter will be governed by the symmetry energy and the slope of it. How quickly do I deal? How how much penalty do I pay if I go away from symmetric or pure neutron matter? And um, this is really unconstrained. For us, we see that it's hard to get above 50 within this approach. You see the fourth model is really on the low end of this arrow band, but all the others are between 40 and 50. So, okay, this was maybe not that interesting for all the people who don't work on this. I, I'm not sure how familiar you are with equations of state, so I just want to have a quick slide and explain what the equation of state really does. So the equation of state is just the relation between pressure and the energy density. So the idea is I have a model of nuclear physics. The model of nuclear physics will give me an equation of state, this relation between pressure and energy density. And if I take this model, this equation of state, plus I specify the pressure at the center, that's an unknown depends on how heavy the star is, right? Just the pressure in the center of the star. And I feed this into the tolman oppenheimer volkov equations. So this is this Tolman TUV machine here. If I feed all of this in and the TUV equations, the TUV equations will give me mass radius relations. So this is what you see here for different models on this axis is radius in kilometers here, masses as um, in solar masses and these horizontal lines are really constraints that we have because we have seen a star with two times the mass of our sun. So every model has to reach that. For instance, here's a model that doesn't reach it. So we can exclude this model. 
So this is what the TV equations give you and what an equation of state can give you. So if you just want this line, all you need is P of epsilon and the TV equations, but we of course want to go further and have some microscopic model. Okay, that's how an equation of state works. And so we have computed the equation of state for our four different models. And this is what I'm plotting here. This is basically the same plot, you now a little bit larger and easier to read, hopefully. So this is the radius in kilometer. And we know from various experiments, like NISA, other multi messenger, multi -messenger constraints um, from LIGO and so on, that the radius of the star is roughly 12 kilometers. And in this publication, people have really put together all the information we have and have come up with these contours. So the dark blue one here is the one sigma. This is the two sigma contour that includes all the information from masses and, um, and radii. And we see that our four models here are really within this contour. And here, when the line starts uh, being dashed, this is when they turn down. So here it would collapse to a black hole. So just to, if you follow, for instance, the fourth model, the purple line here, you dump more and more material on the star, the radius gets smaller. So nuclear matter is quite squishy at this point, right? I dump more material on it, but the star gets smaller. And uh, then it gets, it stays roughly 12 kilometers while it gets heavier, 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 heavier. At some point it will collapse to a black star. Uh, to a black hole. So this is also really an important uh, prediction that tells you a star cannot be more massive than this. So this is why I plot this result here. This is a measurement of uh, the heaviest neutron star we know. This is just the name of this pulsar, which has a mass of 2.07 plus minus 0 0.06. So this is, you see the light orange curve is the two sigma, two sigma range. And this was our goal, like you see the First model is on the low end of the two sigma, the other model is at the high end of the two sigma range. So that's the range we're kind of spanning here with our models. Okay, this was the second part of my talk. I just want to summarize this part. We have developed a new procedure to fit relativistic mean fence models instead of um, symmetric nuclear matter, we fit into pure neutron matter and we get this data from Carl perturbation theory. So this has a couple of advantages. We don't have to extrapolate from 50% neutrons to 90%. We just start with 100% and go down to 90%, which is way easier and closer. We also don't have to extrapolate. So we can use these models for a really wide temperature and density range. You don't have to add a thermal pressure ad hoc. It's really consistently included in the theory. And this is great because now we can describe neutron star mergers for all the temperature and density range um, they are existing in. But this also provides us with some microscopic input for transport calculations. That's what we need, like dispersion relations and things like that. And on top of that, of course, we get an equation of state out of it, but we're getting more out of it. That's the whole point. And the, state, the tables for this equation of state, uh, we're going to put them on compost. This uh, database that you can use so you don't have to compute these models yourself. Um, you can just um, look that up, the tables, get them from compost, and use them in any kind of simulation you want. Okay, do we have any questions on, on this part? I have a quick question, Alex. Yes, sure. Um, so just, just to make sure I understand this. Um, so what, what you kind of add is that you include the car perturbation theory, but um, so, so in order to, to kind of go towards uh, neutron rich matter, um, yes. But also there, there are kind of parameters that are unconstrained in the current perturbation theory Lagrangian. And are they known, those that you need to, to actually make that extrapolation and then describe neutron rich matter or are they also kind of answered? So you have these low energy constants in current perturbation theory that you also have to fit, that's true. Right. But they're really well constrained from scattering and uh, in an experiments. And you only have to fit them once. And people are currently doing um, systematic area studies for that, but there's really not a lot of wiggle room for these low energy constants. And then describing pure neutron matter, you don't have to do anything. That's included in the theory. Okay, but you, you still have to somehow extrapolate to high density. I mean, everything, as far as chiral perturbation theory is concerned, is a really low density. So you really have to go all the way up. So, yes, that's the whole point, right? So um, 
So you see, we use Carl perturbation theory up to two times saturation and only fit in this, oh, we, we fit here yeah, where Carl perturbation theory is. On that high, right? Yeah. And usually I mean, what people do is they describe the really low energy physics and then kind of merge on that. And then they have a model for the high density part and high density usually means everything above saturation density. Um, so- I mean, I mean of course the error band gets wider and wider. So it's- Ambitious. <laughs> maybe, but I mean, I have to trust people who compute that, that they say they have this under control. I mean, you see that the error band gets wide here, right? So, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> but the interesting part is if I stay at this low part here, do you see my mouse or am I? Yeah, I see. Okay, if you stay down here, you never reach two solar masses. If you stay at the lower part. So, I mean, we really try to vary it a lot and govern most of this oh, band, yeah, but yeah. we can. I understand. So, I mean, all this is challenging. I just wonder, yeah. um, you know, for instance, if you do just standard uh, equation of state APR or so, they also have a pure neutron matter equation of state. And you can also trust these guys. Um, and so I wonder what this adds if you kind of include this current perturbation theory. Um, but okay, I see what you do. So you really go kind of all the way and then you yes. get some constraint. Okay. So if you plot like most well-known relativistic mean field theories or models like APR, they are outside of this band. So they don't really, they don't agree on that. And current okay. perturbation theory gives you the most, the best way of doing that in my, as far as I understand. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so if there are no more questions in this part, I will go back to weak interactions now. This is what I wanted to do in the first place. So what do weak interactions do? Well, weak interactions equilibrate particle content, right? They allow neutrons to turn into protons and the other way around. So we call this, once we reach equilibrium, we call this chemical equilibrium or beta equilibrium. So there are two classes of decay or processes that we care about. One of them is neutron decay. So you have a neutron on the left-hand side, whatever other stuff you want, and it turns into a proton and an electron, right? And the inverse class of processes is you have a proton and an electron. And so this is what we call electron capture and you turn into a neutron. So once I, if I wait long enough, these two classes of processes will balance each other out and the composition of matter will not change anymore. So what are all these thoughts? Well, above 10 MeV, you can add neutrinos on the left-hand side because neutrinos are trapped. Below 10 MeV, if they're not trapped, you can only have neutrinos on the right-hand side. You could also have other particles scattering, interacting with these nucleons. I will talk more about this in the next part. What I wanna say is we are focusing now on this low, low temperature part of a merger where neutrinos are where matter is neutrino transparent, the mean free path for neutrinos are rather long. So if these rates balance each other, we can use the uh, principle of detailed balance and just replace these particles with their chemical potentials and find that the neutron chemical potential will be equal to the proton plus the electron chemical potential. So this is what's known as uh, chemical equilibrium or beta equilibrium. And this is certainly true at t equals zero. It's mu n equals mu p plus mu e. But the question is, is this valid at moderate finite temperatures? So that's not that clear a priori, especially in a neutron star merger, which is a finite size system, right? The extent, as I showed you before, is like 20 kilometers or 30 kilometers. And if neutrinos can just escape, that's not really a closed system. So it's not really clear if this is true or if this is violated. So that's the question we're trying to answer. So let me go into a little bit more detail of these weak decays. So you might think, hey, I know about neutron decay. I learned all about that. Neutron decay in a neutron star is a little bit different from a free neutron decay, right? So the problem is, or the, the point is, we call this, this is, it's different, so we give it a different name. We call this direct ERCA. So direct ERCA just is what you would call neutron decay. Neutron turns to proton, electron, and an antineutrino. An electron capture, proton captures an electron, turns into a neutron and a neutrino. So you see neutrinos always on the right-hand side because they don't build up. Fermi surface, they cannot be in the initial channel. I don't have neutrinos available to start on the left-hand side. So what's different in a neutron star? Well, a neutron star is made up of strongly degenerate matter. So matter will build up a Fermi sphere. So this is what I'm trying to draw here. This is a neutron Fermi sphere and the radius of the neutron Fermi sphere is what we call 
the neutron Fermi momentum. And we also have a Fermi sphere for protons and electrons. And because we want matter to be charge neutral, these are really the same size. And the radius is um, the proton Fermi momentum and the electron Fermi momentum. And the surface here, we call this the Fermi surface. The Fermi surface will be a little bit blurred due to the temperature, finite temperature effects. If T was zero, this is really a sharp interface. Everything that's colored is occupied. Higher momentum states are empty. So the best way for this decay to happen is if I can take a neutron directly from its Fermi surface and decay to a proton and an electron on their Fermi surface. So this is um, so these decays are really dominated by particles on their Fermi surface. If I have to go into and dig into the Fermi surface, so the point is I always have to obey energy momentum conservation, right? That's I can never get around that. So if I need want to do that, and I in order to do that, I have to dig into deep into the Fermi surface, I need a lot of energy to get up here first. Or if I need to make a hole here, the same story, right? So it will be exponentially suppressed this decay. So momentum conservation on the Fermi surface really demands that the sum of these two can make up the neutron Fermi momentum. I need enough proton relative to neutrons that I can fulfill this triangle equation. So I've drawn this triangle here. I have a neutron Fermi momentum and if the electron and the proton, same size, together are capable of making up the neutron Fermi momentum, then I can have direct ergon without it being strongly suppressed. So is there a way around that? What happens if I can't do that? Well, there's modified ergon. So what I can always do, I can add another particle, right? I have another nucleon here. So this is the same slide here, but I added modified ergon. Modified ergon, you can understand it as direct ergon with a spectator. So really you have a neutron, which is strongly interacting with another nucleon. It can be neutron or a proton, doesn't matter. So you can like bump it up from its Fermi surface higher or whatever you need and it decays to proton, electron, antineutrino, and the spectator just goes along. Then I can always make up this triangle by just adding another particle on both sides. And the same is true for electron capture. I have modified worker electron capture, proton plus electron plus spectator turns into neutron, neutrino, and the spectator. So if a direct worker is suppressed because I don't have enough protons, then modified ARCA will probably dominate, at least at low temperatures. So when is direct ARCA possible on the Fermi surface? Well, we call this the direct ARCA threshold. And this is really a property of the nuclear model or the equation of state. So when this triangle equation that I've uh, drawn here is exactly fulfilled, so if they are parallel and can exactly make up the neutron Fermi momentum, this is what we call the direct ARCA threshold. So I've plotted this, the difference between these two sides here. So this plot, this is a function of density for two, two different models, the IUF model and the SFHO model. And if this quantity is negative, this means dark drug will be exponentially suppressed. If it's positive up here in this green shaded region, then it's allowed. And what you see here is that for IUF, we're getting closer and closer to this allowed region as a function of density. At some point we are crossing and now direct ERCA is allowed, while for another model SFHO, we're never getting up there. So that's really interesting. It's quite different. It makes a huge difference for things like cooling or so, because direct ERCA sucks out energy out of the system very, very quickly because it meets so many neutrinos and they can just leave and cool down the star. And we don't really know whether nature allows direct ERCA or not. So that's really unconstrained. So this line here is what we call the direct arc threshold. So you see, as I said before, I need enough protons relative to the neutrons and the proton fraction in all models that I know is always going up here. So there's really a minimum density that I need to reach in order to have direct arc allowed. And this minimum density in some models is as low as two times saturation and some model don't have one at all. So I, have, I will focus on IUF and the rest of the, my slides. And IUF does have a diatoka threshold at roughly 4 or 4.1 times saturation. OK, so I said if mu n equals mu p plus mu e, the sum of all electron capture rates, which is direct ERCA plus modified ERCA, should be equal to the sum of the neutron decay rates because they balance each other. This is what chemical equilibrium is all about. So let's check if this is the case. So this is this plot here, function of density again. 
So you see this um, vertical line is the direct ERCA threshold for IUF. Let's forget about the blue lines. We just look at the, at the orange line. So this is now really this rate. This is how fast neutrons decay. This line tells you how fast is neutron decay. And you see this step-like function behavior. And this is because here, direct ERCA is allowed. We're above the threshold. You see how it quickly increases above the threshold. And below, it gets really low because it's here it's mostly modified ERCA that takes over, but modified ERCA is slower. So here it's direct ERCA um, uh, dominated. Here it's modified ERCA dominated. While for um, if we look at electron capture, direct ERCA plus modified, you see, wait, that's way up higher there. It shows similar behavior. We still see this direct ERCA threshold. It goes down here, but not as quickly. And even above, it's not the same at all. But I claim there should be the same. So we see really that at, this is a 3 MeV calculated. We really see that chemical equilibrium is clearly violated. These two rates are not the same at all. They even they differ by, I don't know if you can read this, but here it's like two orders of magnitude with 10 to the minus 16, 10 to the minus 14, or so one and a half orders of magnitude. So cold beta equilibrium is clearly violated. And the reason for that is electron capture and neutron take K are not really the inverse to each other, right? Detailed balance requires that I just turn this error around. If I can do that, then this is, these two rates are really inverse to each other. But the neutrino is switching side. It's always on the right-hand side. Once it's paired up with the neutrino, with the neutron, so I have a two particles going to two particles, kind of decay here. And here I have literally one particle going to three. So that's not quite the same. And this is why detailed balance is violated here. So what if I want to bring this up? Well, I want more neutron decay. I have to increase the neutron chemical potential. It's not just mu P plus mu E. There's a correction to it. And you see this correction will be density dependent. And I can compute this correction that we'll be doing here. And we have published this in, these two, in this paper, which is really an extension of this paper of uh, Mark Alford and Stephen Harris in 2018. And we call this warm beta equilibrium. So mu n is not just mu p plus mu e. I've told you I have to bump it up a little bit. We call this delta mu, and this is density dependent. And we compute delta mu numerically. There's no first principle uh, behind this, such that now all the neutron decay rates are equal. So I, I'm looking for equilibrium. I'm writing a small root finding algorithm that changes the neutron chemical potential until these two rates are equal. And I'm plotting here as a function of density again, just for ILF. I'm plotting this correction to the cold beta equilibrium delta mu. You see here three different lines for three different temperatures. As one MeV, the correction reaches up to five MeV or so here. Uh, I forgot to draw the dark dark threshold. It's roughly here, four times saturation. See for three MeV, I'm already getting a higher value. Even above the threshold, they're not really the same. And for 5 MeV, I'm getting values between 15 and nearly 20 MeV of a correction to this um, condition. So normally, neutron chemical potential is roughly 1,000. This is 900 something, depends on the density, and the electron between 100 and 200 or so. Um, so yeah, you see it's violated, and I have to correct it. And this is the correction I need to do. So if I introduce this correction now, this is now the rate in true equilibrium. The dashed line now is electron capture. The golden line is our direct ERCA. And you see now these rates truly agree. They drop off at the threshold. This is still the rate as a function of density, same plot as before. And you see how it drops off quickly. And I have successfully computed um, chemical equilibrium. The other plot I want to show here is Many people are also claimed that at the beginning, right, that above the threshold, so this is the same plot, density rate, above the threshold, um, direct ERCA is big, below threshold, modified ERCA is big. So if we look at electron capture, which is the dashed line, this is all for one model now, we see the dashed line in gold is a modified ERCA electron capture, and it's down here. And direct ERCA electron capture is up here. So it's true that direct ERCA dominates above the threshold, but it also dominates below the threshold. So 3 MeV of temperature enough to give me so much temperature that I can get particles out of the Fermi sphere from further down to have direct ERCA operating at a faster rate than modified ERCA. Because you really, 
this solid line makes it a little bit confusing. For neutron decay, it's still true. Direct ERCA dominates because it drops off quite a lot and modified ERCA dominates this regime. But for electron capture, not true at all. If you compare the dashed lines, you see really this is the leading line and this is always suppressed. So that's basically all I wanted to tell you to give you a final summary. What I said is we need to improve microscopic physics in simulations. Bulk viscosity might play an important role in binary neutron star merger. We're currently working on that and trying to implement this in collaboration with Elias Most and um, George and Romney. We're trying to really incorporate viscosity in these rates into merger simulations. Traditional PT equilibrium is violated. And this is really a theme that we've seen. People have calculated all kinds of properties for neutron stars at t equals zero, because that's all you have to do for all isolated neutron stars. But really, we have to reevaluate a lot of this knowledge because we're now reaching temperatures of up to 80 MeV, and a lot of stuff is just not true anymore. So, oh, sorry, this should be delta mu. We changed the notation at some point. Reaches up to 15, maybe 20 MeV, this correction, and direct arc can still dominate. So really, Corona, we want to keep doing this and try to find other transport properties. We want to see what delta mu has an effect. We want to uh, do further research on this strange as equilibration, but that's all stuff for the future. So I'm done for now. Thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Alexander. Uh, it was very interesting talk. Uh, so is there any question from audience? I'm sure Kai has more questions to you. Actually, I do, but let's wait for anyone, someone else. I already asked questions <laughs> in case someone else. It questions. seems no. So Kai, you can go on. OK. Um, so I mean, the, the, the first is more comment. Um, in the beginning, you showed this nice uh, phase diagram and pointed out that, you know, we can probe kind of the, the, the high temperature part of that phase diagram. Um, but in reality, I mean, that's related to your to the third part of your talk. Um, I mean, there's a third axis, right? And so what you're really probing is surely somehow, somehow far away on that third axis, namely the, the kind of chemical equilibrium. You won't be really in chemical equilibrium very likely most of the time. So it's a bit more tricky. Um, That's not that obvious actually, right? So, I mean, from our calculations, we would estimate you, it's hard to get into equilibrium below temperatures of like three MeV or so. Once you reach like five, 10 MeV, you're most likely in chemical equilibrium. How do you know? <laughs> well, we can compute the rates and see how fast they are, and you get a time scale out of this. And the time scale is like below a millisecond or so. So you're really fast in equilibration. No, but you in, in other words, spark viscosity is super low. Yeah. Sorry, you have oscillations on a millisecond time scale, and initially you have density compressions of basically hundred percent or something like this. And this is something I'm, I'm, me and Bashak uh, are currently looking into. And I think it's not clear at all that you stay close to a chemical equilibrium. I mean, it's-, it's In the low like, density, low temperature really part, you're certainly far away from it. In the neutrino trap part, I would say you're safely in equilibrium. In between, I don't know. Okay. Okay, yeah. But the neutrino true, trap so part, you won't get a lot of bug viscosity anyway. So that's no. not that interesting, I guess, but- in the other case, where you might get a lot, so the interesting case, I'm not so sure if you already say. I mean, okay, we, we're not there yet. We're looking into no, this. But I can, what I'm pretty sure you're close. Okay, let's look at the two extremes, right? You can either freeze everything and say the rates are infinitely slow and everything stays where it is before they merge, or you're in equilibrium. These are the two extremes. And I would say you're closer to equilibrium than you're to the frozen. If you need to do one of these two, equilibrium is probably better. Not perfect, for sure not. It will make a difference, but okay. Okay. That's from all my calculations and my intuition. Okay. And so, 
another question I have is, I mean, say this, this effect that you find that, you know, this, this chemical equilibrium condition surely also ho only holds at t equals zero. Um, I mean, okay, that kind of follows directly from the thermodynamic derivation that you take the zero temperature limit to get to this well, simple relation between chemical potentials. Um, but are you saying there's anything on top of that? Because when you explained it and said, okay, you know, it's, it's a different kind of, I mean, the neutrino is always on the right-hand side. It sounded like there's even more to that. Uh, and so that's why I'm, what I'm trying to understand. Is it just, okay, well, yes, you have to take into account temperature corrections. They're crucial. Or is there even something else that... Um, well, I think the important point is that you're in a finite size system, right? I mean, the whole point, it's not a closed system because the neutrinos can ex escape, right? If the neutrinos were trapped, if you're in a really infinite system, you would get a neutrino chemical potential and you would be in the equilibrium mu n plus mu neutrino equals mu p plus mu e, right? And then you get detailed balance is a really fundamental principle, but it relies on you being in a closed system. And that's the big difference you are not it's a little bit a hack right i mean we're saying if you would wait in an infinite amount of time and the universe is not expanding and whatnot you could have detailed balance and you wouldn't have to to do this but it's a mix of finite size and finite temperature that gets you out of equilibrium which is a, the main point is right even if you wait long enough in the merger you're not going to get to mu n equals mu p plus mu e even if it settles down it will settle down to a different value okay but i mean the, the, the finite size okay that's even more complicated then you would really have to take into account that yeah you, you have neutrino trapping and things change all the time the, the, the conditions change from place to place all the time everything's very violent um but this is not something that's in your analysis yet or is it the finite side no no we i mean in, it's in that sense that we look at the two extreme cases right they're completely trapped they build a fermi sphere and whatnot and they are completely escaping of course you have a weird mix in between where you have some neutrinos they might not even be equilibrated you have a non-thermal distribution of neutrinos that will change everything again sure but yeah we we can compute the rates in these two extreme cases completely trapped, completely transparent. Okay, thank you. Jano uh, Jam, there's a wrong question in chat. Yes, yes, oh. I realized that. Alexander, I don't know if you can read the chat. Yeah, well, yeah I just see, okay. How exactly do you define modified argument when direct ERCA is open? Do you include self in it? Okay, we're trying, we're currently working on including self energies in the nuclear propagators. That's another project that I didn't talk about, but I'm not quite sure what you mean by how do you define. I can always compute the modified or a matrix element and compute the rate that results as a result, right? So I mean, that's all we do. And we always compute it in the Fermi surface approximation. The direct arc rate I can compute at finite temperature doing the full phase space integral because it's a 12 dimensional one that's doable. For modified, it's 18. That's just too complicated. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I mean, there will be a poll if you include the, the internal nucleon propagator. Uh, maybe I have. OK, I do have a slide for that. Let me share again. Uh, Okay, so this is what Peter is talking about. You have modified ERCA, you have this interaction. So this is the Feynman diagram for modified ERCA. You have the propagate the uh, spectator nucleon interacting via strong interaction with the incoming neutron. And I model is here with pion exchange as any kind of strong interaction. And then you have this off shell internal propagator. And if you describe this propagator with an yeah, uh, bare nucleon propagator E squared minus the dispersion relation. If it goes on shell, you get this divergence. That's the one Peter's talking about. Um, in the standard calculation, this is approximated by just one of them UE, so you don't get this divergence. But you're probably right. Maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense doing that here. Um, yeah, so we use this approximation, then you can compute modified or above the threshold as well. And it's just basically constant doesn't change much with with density
Yeah, I think I, I'm in, in, in their analysis, they find that this can be an order of magnitude effect or something like this, taking that effect into account. So since everything is kind of subtle and there are lots, lots of effects, it might have an impact. Yeah, uh, we're working on that right now, but we don't have final results yet. So I didn't, didn't want to present too much. I think Peter is writing something in the chat. Okay. I think we agree now. <laughs> so yeah, it's a simplified, it's a very simple approximation that has been used a lot in the literature and that's all I'm showing right now, yeah. We are trying to do better. Okay, is there any other question? It seems there is no any other question. Uh, we thank you, Alexander, again, and we also thank Kai and Peter for contribution. Well, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Okay, so uh, thanks to everyone for joining and see you in our next talk. See you. Bye. Thanks, Alex. Bye. Thanks. See you.